Today's guest is Vivica Minigatz. So she is a functional nutritionist with a holistic approach to healing. Um, I'm just going to say right now, we were like, oh my gosh, we are soul sisters. Very, very aligned in our beliefs about what matters. But what really uh, Vivica brings to the table is that she specializes in endocrine rebalance. So hormone related issues. How do we get these rebalanced? And especially regarding trauma, what happens in the body as a result of trauma and how do we get that back to balance? Um, she goes into detail about how we often just want to go completely from the physical route, but she's talking about how much of this healing process is involving our spiritual beliefs, um, what's going on inside of us, the healing that needs to take place. Now, she also obviously also deals with the, the food aspect, the, the actual physical aspects of it. And she actually has a course called the healing foods, uh, method where it's a highly individualized course. And she also works one-on-one -on -one with people to help them discover and eliminate the root cause of the issues that they're having, whether it's disease, autoimmunity, thyroid, et cetera. Um, she's also a food photographer. She's from Italy. So you'll hear her beautiful accent as we get into the interview. Um, she has been through her own healing journey to overcome prediabetes, an autoimmune thyroid disorder. Um, she's really been through it and she's very, very committed to healing. Um, one thing I love that she said in the interview was that she um, stopped only doing courses and groups because she just didn't feel like she could get deep enough um, with people that she, like as far as she wanted to, even though her, her course, as she describes is very, um, individualized. She's created that way to help you understand what you will need. She also works with people one-on-one -on -one, and I was like, dude, that's freaking awesome. Um, she is a passionate advocate of a therapeutic ketogenic and carnivore diet, just like I am using it for a purpose, not committed to it forever, but when used correctly for the right person, it's a very powerful tool. And she's a fan of that. Um, if you heard my episode with Aaron Blevins, um, they created their essential carnivore cookbook, uh, together. Uh, if you want to find her online, she's the nourish caveman.com, um, and journey to wholeness love. And she's the nourished caveman on Instagram. If you want to find her there. So yeah, man, this is a beautiful episode. Like we were seriously like, we have to be in person. She's just like, just a very heart-based healer and very, very good at what she does. So I think you guys will get a lot out of this episode. We'll go ahead and get into it. Here is Vivica Minigatz. Okay, guys, I'm super excited to have Vivica here today because this is something that comes up all the time in my coaching. I was telling Vivica before the show often when, especially women, but it affects men too, but very often I see with women, I see hormone disruption, endocrine disorders, PCOS, um, hypothyroidism, autoimmune issues. And every time we get into the meat and potatoes, I always ask, when did this start? you know, and they might say, oh, when I was in fifth grade, when I was 17, I'm like, and my next question is always, so what happened? Like what mm -hmm. happened in your life at that age? And it's like, ah, there's like, I, I would say every time, maybe it feels like every time there's some sort of trauma rooted and it's gut issue started first. And they went to all these doctors and no one could figure it out. And I'm like, so how did you get help processing the trauma that happened? It's like, uh, I don't know, like, you know, <laughs> so let's start here. Cause this is your specialty. So I'm so excited to be able to dive into this with you, um, in, in regards to trauma and emotional issues that happen to us, how does this manifest in the body? Um, this is really interesting because like, it took me years to get to this point where like, you know, just to get a little bit of context to your audience of like, how do they get to this connection is that, you know, after being a nutritionist for seven years and working with like countless patients and digging, 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 I noticed one thing that some people got better through my program and it was kind of fast and like smooth and direct, mm -hmm. especially hormone rebalancing. And some women, I work mostly like about 95% with women, some women never got better. And no matter what we did, no matter how compliant they were, no matter how they took all their supplements, made the dietary changes, exercise, slept, yeah. still no changes. So in my digging process, I finally, you know, got to that point where asking about what happened and, you know, it's really kind of a delicate thing to do because a lot of people, 
first of all, they're not aware that they even had trauma. Yeah. And that was one of those. It took me many, many years to cultivate the awareness of what happened to me, right. you know, and what the cascade, like the domino effect from yeah. that root cause. And so you need to be really careful because a lot of people have a lot of fear around yeah looking at what happened and they have a lot of preconceived notions this is something pretty new Tara you know I'm sure that you you encountered this a lot in your practice and like you know in your experience that even 20 years ago there was really no talk of trauma and as you know the PTSD diagnosis is about maybe 30 years old in the DSM so before 30 years there was not even a diagnosis that involved post-traumatic stress um so these are kind of new new modalities new practices and a new lens to which through which we can look at health issues and just issues in general they're like dysfunction or less than optimal condition for a person so all of these will lead you to those root causes and I think that it's still very important to treat the body the physical body because like years of post-trauma have led to physical effects and repercussions that are now real in the physical body that we do need to address as well yeah and then like but if we don't have the other piece of information which is like how did all this like you know, generate and where is it sprouting from, then yeah. we can keep cutting. It's like right. poison oak, you know. I don't know if you ever dealt with poison oak <laughs> in Oregon and California. There is lots of it. And you can cut it, you can burn it, you can like put chemicals on it, but if you don't get the roots out, it travels underground, it'll sprout somewhere else. And then yeah. you cut that one and it'll go sprout somewhere else. And so this is just the same with like this physical and hormonal, especially issues um, with women who have severe childhood trauma. And let's just frame the word trauma a little bit, because like, I think this is a word that is very used these days in a lot of different fields. Right. But um, we need to understand, because there is a concept, like when you talk about PTSD, a lot of people think that the traumatic event has been a major traumatic event, something like rape, incest, um, a car crash, major car crash, or like a major surgery, or like abuse, Mm -hmm. sexual abuse, like those are really big things. It could be like one incident, like a a really severe car accident can cause PTSD. But this is not something that the majority of people are actually dealing with. And um, there is a really good book that I haven't even finished yet. It just came out not too long ago and it's called What Happened to You? It's the Oprah book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, It's titled What Happened to You? And it's really about reframing our perspective of health and mental health um, from what's wrong with you versus what happened to you. It's a really cool book. But it it really has... um, a good way of framing trauma as any experience that let's call it in the first seven to 14 years of life, the formative years, the brain keeps forming until about 21, but the major, like the impact is strongest as we are youngest. So in the first two months of life, any disruptive event is like going to have a bigger impact than anything else that will happen in the next 10 years. Um, so any event that has been disruptive enough to cause overwhelming emotions that the person or the infant or the child was not able to navigate without the proper support, or it was disruptive to be absolutely emotionally overwhelming. And then also at the same time, there was not a framework or a support system in place that was able to like immediately um give support to the child or infant and especially when it comes to really early trauma these incredibly disruptive events that can happen in the first couple of months of life you know I was dealing with um a patient who is a close friend as well she's my friend and my patient but we were talking about I just ran all her labs and look at her thyroid 
and she's had Hashimoto's for many years and she had severe thyroid problems. She's only 33. And uh, she's now also starting to show some other hormone issues, like probably her adrenals are involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm waiting for her hormone results to come back. We just did a Dutch test, Mm -hmm. um, but her thyroid results came back. And we have been working also about her childhood trauma. So she had um, a severe issue with her eyes as a baby. And so she had to be sent to get surgery at like two months of age. And so she was separated from her mother Mm. for about two weeks, I think. Mm. And she was going blind basically. And until they figured it out, it was about two months after she was born that she was slowly going blind. So then they found out and she had to be sent for surgery Mm. and she was separated from her mom. And those are things that even just 10 years ago, they would have been considered normal. Right. Like this just happened. Done, right. Eyes are fixed. All good. Yeah. You know, but now looking back, you know, how do we connect those experiences to her Hashimoto thyroiditis? She has an autoimmune disease of the thyroid and her hormonal issues. And also, of course, there are other elements that come in and contribute. And so, for example, when we speak about the thyroid, you know, we do still have to be aware of the weaknesses that can bring an imbalance in our endocrine system. So, you know, the trauma is a big one for me that is like at the very root and that will cause a weakness. You know, it's not just like trauma will like completely imbalance your thyroid like this. Yeah. So the trauma causes a weakness and an inability to properly be in energetic balance. And so what happens sometimes is like maybe your organ or gland is not getting the proper energy. So it's not getting good blood flow. It's not getting good nutrient flow. Right. So the cells become necrotic. Um, so there is like a shedding of cells. There is, you know, antibodies start forming on a um, physical level in the bloodstream. So this all is a physical process that's caused by an energetic root. And yeah. then because this physical weakness is now established, then your gland will be more susceptible. Right. And, um, you know, so both in my case and her case, I had a lot of mercury fillings. Mm-hmm. And she also has mercury filling, so she hasn't taken out yet. And so having that mercury in your mouth will like slowly, 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 totally. like this is like something so common in people that have mm-hmm. Hashimoto's undetected dental issues. And it could be uh, root canals. It can be low-grade infections that have been brewing there for years, mm-hmm. you know, fillings that have not been well executed or the dreaded heavy metals. But why do some people get Hashimoto's and some don't? That's a big question, right? Like, how come? Is it just genetics? Is it like that I'm genetically not predisposed? You know, I believe more in epigenetics than genetics. So yeah. there is the ability to switch those genes on and off, you know, and the yeah. resilience, which is like my favorite word, is like <laughs> resilience, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, how do we keep ourselves healthy and our beautiful hormones in balance? You know, when there is original trauma, it really affects that resilience. So the original trauma will affect the resilience, which then will open up, like, for example, the thyroid to take in the heavy metals instead of just like kind of passing by, you know, Um, the body has an amazing ability to deal with toxicity when the body is in balance. Right. Yeah. And I... I, I think it's, it's, it's so, I love this, um, getting to what trauma is, you know, and what was coming to my mind as you were explaining that. And, and I don't know if I, I, I guess this is a question for you. The one thing I've noticed is that trauma can be very relative, you know? So sometimes I'll notice with clients that I'll be like, you know, like, um, stuff will come up and I'm like, you know, if you're comfortable talking about it, like, was there something that happened childhood? Nope. I had a great childhood. Like everything was cool. Like we, you know, good parents, good, solid home, whatever. And then as we get later in coaching stuff will come up, like, 
oh, well, yeah. I mean, my mom used to always like tell me I needed to watch my weight or my mom would tell me like, you're so pretty. If you just lost five or 10 more pounds, you would be gorgeous. And, um, uh, my dad or my dad, you know, if this is really typical with men since success is such a shame point for men. Oh yeah. My dad, I just always felt like my dad thought my brother was going to be successful, but not me. He would say things like that. And so I just had this belief and now, you know, what does that lead to this chronic proving of, I can be successful, you know, and this hyper adrenal overdrive stuff. And so, um, I'm curious your thoughts on that too. Do you see this at like, I, I, like a relative trauma, like people don't realize that they kind of had this traumatic experience because they weren't raped, you know, but it's like, yeah, exactly. but if something hurt you down to your core as a little kid and changed your whole belief system of now I have to prove mm -hmm. my value, I think it can lead to those same tendencies in the body of like, no, this can't be true about me. I have to prove it's not. Have, have you noticed things like that in your practice as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, I call them the programs, you know, yeah. so these like the trauma, meaning that event or there is, I don't know if you ever heard of um, PTSD, complex PTSD. Yeah. So complex PTSD is something even newer than PTSD. And I was just me, reading about this yesterday. Sorry. So I'm just really? like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Fill us in. I've, I've been really passionate about it because first of all, it's made a huge difference in my life and the perspective of like, I've had one of those childhood where my mother for my whole life is like, you had a great childhood, you know? And I was like, wait, things don't add up. And, mm -hmm. you know, then through this trauma information, I was able to see that actually, no, that wasn't really the case. Actually, the opposite, there was some major trauma in my life that has shaped my whole life in a very specific way and my health, you yeah. know, and I can share a little bit about my crazy health story, but, you know, I am pretty healthy now at 53, but before I've gone through like every single possible imaginable kind of thing you know, from like pre-diabetes to, you know, heavy metal poisoning, thyroiditis and all of those things. Um, so CPTSD is called complex PTSD is exactly that. It's not one large traumatic event, mm -hmm. but it is a series of let's call maybe uneventful kind of events that happen through sustained periods of time. Yeah. And they create these patterns, like they create coping mechanisms. Yes. You know, what we used to call, that's a little bit older lingo, coping mechanisms. Right. Now we call them more like trauma responses. Yeah. You know, I think it's a more accurate way of describing yeah. the coping mechanisms and patterns. Right. You know, so there are patterns of trauma response that can be a little bit different from person to person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when a person has sustained prolonged trauma in childhood from CPTSD, you know, something that can go completely undetected, but is exactly what you were talking about, you know, is a constant undermining maybe from your primary parent figure. Right. And it could be your mom, your dad, your grandparent, you know, your aunt, yeah. whoever is like your primary caregiver can transmit and this is like the generational you know inheritance it was mm -hmm. a term I heard yesterday that was so brilliant oh my god of course I forgot it it's the first time I heard it is like transgenerational something it's like the inheritance that we get and these are the mm -hmm. patterns that you know generation to generation they get transmitted right. those like those beliefs the belief systems yeah so is that voice that of your mom that because she is insecure about her weight and she right. was shamed as a child right. now she's passing it on to you and right. saying like the one my mom used to tell me I still talk, talk about it with her but she's like the beauty of the ass ass like donkey you know yeah. in Italian is called asino which is a donkey slash ass and it's like the beauty of the ass goes away so you better do xyz get married soon because otherwise you're gonna get ugly Whoa. and old and nobody's gonna want you and uh. you're gonna get fat and, <laughs> and not just that but ass also means stupid in italian you know if you're an ass you're an ass like here yeah wow <laughs> so there's a great like, example Dude, that's a hard program to undo i'm still yeah. dealing with it to this day right. after like 20 years of deprogramming right but 
it really shaped my whole life. And, you know, of course it influenced my health because like the subsex, subsequent beliefs in my head is like, I'm an ass, I'm stupid. I, you know, my intelligence does not worth anything. It will never be valued, especially right. by man, right. because men just want a piece of ass. You right. know, it translates kind of nicely. And English. you're just, so you're not only feeling stupid, but you're also running from looking old or wearing out. Or so you got to be in overdrive to make sure that that doesn't happen because you're literally running from demons in your mind. Like oh, the worst one. case scenario, because your whole value is wrapped up into it. Yeah, yeah. Classic, classic. And then you have body dysmorphia, <laughs> right? eating disorders, yep. you know, anorexia, if not bulimia. And yep. I mean, I skirted on both of them. Luckily, I never got really deep into the eating disorders but I definitely touch on them yeah and then like constant stress yeah and um you know adrenals sex hormones all of it it's like it all weaves in together yeah because anytime you believe that your intrinsic value as a human being is wrapped up into some sort of conditional love, some sort of earning, whether that was success or your body. These are the, probably the two most common ones. I'd say, you know, Brene Brown says that women's number one shame point is their body men. Their number mm -hmm. one shame point typically is success. And you see this all over the place. Like I have to earn it. And it, it's a very yeah. conditional love um, mindset of, okay, yeah, I approve of you. If you're just exactly as I expect, and if not, yep. I hate you. You're worthless. Like I will do anything it takes. I mean, I've had clients get into drug addictions just to run from that demon. So they wouldn't be hungry. I've had, you know, obsessive nonstop working because they just have to prove that they are successful. They can be, you know, and it's mad. It's that and your intrinsic values wrapped up into it. I mean, you'll yeah. do anything because it's the survival of the ego. Right. So totally. yeah. Thanks for sharing that example. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so here we are, we're, we've got these trauma stories, trauma responses, or we have these programs running in our head. What happens from here in the body? They just <clears throat> translate like our belief systems really shape our reality. And like, you know, just thinking that first, you know, is your actions and your thoughts is the yeah. constant stress, like you talked about. Yeah. And then like you also just mentioned is like, what actions do we take? Right. You know, many clients I have that with hormonal issues now they're in their forties and fifties and they have a lifetime of like eating disorder, a lifetime yeah. of like, um, antitamine abuse. You remember the good old fan fan? Yep. <laughs> like, it was a thing back in yep. the days. Like now it's Adderall. Now it's Adderall. It's kind of the replacement. Now it's Adderall and Ritalin, right? right? And yep. yeah. And so it really translates in the way that we care right. or not care for their, our body. And so right. finally, like it starts layering up all these layers of like substances and lack of nutrients, dysfunctional behaviors. And, yes. you know, it just compounds. And then like, I don't know if you ever heard of homotoxicology. Um, no. Homotoxicology is very interesting kind of uh, branch of nutrition, but it talks about accumulation of toxicity in the body and how okay. that fosters disease okay and yeah. like the different layers and the different phases of disease mm. as cool. the body becomes toxic mm. and this is really interesting because we can relate that toxicity also to being a, um, energetic toxicity so yeah. our thoughts can be right. toxic you know so when we have that feeling of self-loading our thoughts become toxic to our right. body we become toxic to ourselves right and look at so many people with high trauma they have autoimmune diseases right and like that correlation is just barely starting to be made you know yeah and as you look at the literal chemical release in the body when we have these self-defeating thoughts and we go into these low vibrational energies like guilt and shame or stress or not enoughness you literally release cortisol and adrenaline. And, you know, sure that might, uh, what's interesting is I, um, I don't know if you've, you know, dived into Joe Dispenza's work on being addicted to certain emotions, but oh, it's, yeah. It, yeah, it's so interesting how like at first that kind of becomes like a motivator for people. It's like, oh, I, I almost kind of like being in this stress response because I, I'm achieving in life and it's I know, I helping me. Done. 
Yeah. And I, I, it helps me be skinny. Cause I'm just like, you know, mobilizing fat and it, I have all this energy and I can prove my value, but what happens over the time is you end up getting pre-diabetic or diabetic or hormone issues, like you're saying. And, um, mm. I, I, and so it's like, yeah, it's at first, it, it seems like those emotions almost can like serve you. And so it's, it's easy to get addicted to being in that emotional state because it's familiar and you're getting something out of it. And so, you know, Joe talks about how you'll use new people and new situations to refill that and recreate need, them, recreate it so that you can stay mm -hmm. in that state that you're familiar with, yes. you know? And so until you get to that root, that poison Oak, like you're saying under the ground, way deep in there, it's tucked so far away. Sometimes we, it's difficult to access because our brains are trying to protect us from it, but it's like, and that's when, you know, we need help. We usually need outside hands because we're operating out of what we have, you know, it's until you get there, it does just seem like it will be this chronic issue. And I love that you're saying, talking about how our thoughts become actions. Um, one thing that I like to, uh, <laughs> demonstrate with my clients who have, you know, binge eating so they've had this really restrictive mm -hmm. mindset around food and there's want to be super, super controlled. And then of course, you know, the reins come off at some point they binge, they shame mm -hmm. themselves, then they fast or whatever. And the whole thing repeats. And I look at this as like that, the inner tyrant, you know, like is, is that parent or whoever they felt as a kid was like, no, 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 you can't have that. Or don't be like that. Or you'll be better mm -hmm. if you don't. And then the inner child is this little rebel. That's like, watch me. And so you're in this like power battle inside your own self of like tyrant, totally. inner, inner child, rebel, tyrant, inner child, rebel. And it's like, it's a grind. It's, it's a horrible place to be. I've been there before I did yeah. all my healing work. And man, it's just like, it's hard to be successful. It's hard to be happy in your life because you're in this constant battle inside of yourself that consumes you. So yeah, being yeah. there too. Yeah. And it's interesting that also ties in with CPTSD because in CPTSD, we talk about the inner critic Yeah, and like people that have CPTSD, CPTSD they have this inner critic yes. that is just like the critic on steroids. And yeah. it's, it's like that tyrant and like it's mm -hmm. just always there and it like wants you to do things a certain way but then of course the rebellion comes yeah. in sometimes and then that battle ensues and like how do we deal with that you know how we do we reprogram that voice that is so relentless and so ruthless inside of us and you know it really drives you into this like downward spiral that they seem to never end so if someone's listening to this and they're like Ooh, this is sounding a little too familiar. Where do you direct them from here? Like, where do, where do you recommend starting on this path of healing? Cause you, like you said, it can be scary to even, you've been protecting yourself from this for so long. It's like, you don't even want to admit it. You're like, no, I'm good. Like it, it's nothing. It's fine. I'm good. You know, fine being the absence of acknowledging any emotions, you know? So where, right. where are some places that you recommend starting on this path of healing in a, in a gentle and um, manageable way? Mm -hmm. You know, it really depends on the individual and where, what level of healing they're ready for. Yeah. So I would say that the majority of people these days, they're still only available for physical healing. Mm. And this is like, you know, even though there are a lot of people, it's called awakening, uh -huh. which is just becoming aware of deeper issues and like right. wanting to open the door to this deeper knowledge of themselves you know, and the, those root causes that we've been talking about. But there is still like a lot of people that are terrified of that. And it's just also like, look, I'm from Italy. In my country, I was born and raised. I left when I was 19. In Italy, you don't talk about this stuff. Right. Like my mom lived there. I talked to her almost every day with Skype every day, especially because I haven't seen her in two years, mm -hmm. you know, in person. Mm -hmm. And we like when I try to explain to her about the work that I do with trauma and like also my work with women, because I do work with women ab about trauma. And this is like aside from the nutrition in my other practice that I go more into the emotional and trauma healing. But when I talk about that, she's not just like, you know, it's just like we don't talk about that. It's like wow. here, like, you know, what do you want? Why do you have to open that door? Why do you have to talk about those things? Mm. You know, can't you just live a normal life? That's wow. her tagline. Right. Can't you just live a normal life? Wow. Can't you just like, 
we leave me alone is also our tagline just like I just want to be left alone Mm, so not ready am, to address any of it <laughs> so yeah. in our case I know like you know there are some people like my stepdad is not open even for physical healing so wow, I know right. that like there are people that are just not open to look right. at any of it right. and they're just going to continue on their track default right. and bless their soul not this lifetime right. that's what it is right and it's completely useless to push you know totally um somebody into something they're not ready their soul is not ready their emotion is not ready and like him not ready not even like you know it goes to doctors takes medications and you know that's what he wants to do that's it my mom at least she's open for like physical healing so a little bit you know there are people that will be open to radical physical healing where they're like gonna be transforming the health and really get a grip on their diet and do great and thrive. And then, you know, maybe that's not enough. And, you know, there are people that are open to the awareness of the emotional and trauma root causes, but they're not quite ready to go there yet. Right. Like I have some patients that I talk to them about the deeper work. They know there is a deeper work. One of my clients fired or shrinks. She's like, you can do both jobs. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, I have someone I refer out to for the really deep subconscious. Uh He's amazing. And I've had many clients be like, I don't think I'm going to work with my therapist anymore. And there's amazing therapists and no disrespect at all. Right, exactly. Often um, therapy is when people generally become aware of what's going on. I don't often see the repatterning happening as a result. And sometimes coaches can be a little more into the re. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we know. So what now, you know, like, how does this, I think trauma informed therapy, that's something that anybody who's listening to this, if you do want to get into the deeper, you know, so you ask, where do we start? So you can start with your physical health, go to a coach, a nutritionist, you know, Mm-hmm. Even a functional medicine doctor, they're a little more conservative, like, you know, backwards. But yeah. anyways, they're good. Better than yeah. nothing, <laughs> you know. And then if you're open for more, I would definitely recommend trauma-informed therapy. Hmm. Um, it will do 10 times more than any conventional therapy that has oh. existed up to this point. I see okay. that, you know, I have clients that are actually our therapists. I have a couple of them their therapies and they're going to therapy and I had to recommend them it's like get this book take it to your therapist and work together on the, with this trauma-informed modality because you've been in therapy for 20 years and it's done nothing really right not, you know it's right. done 10 percent right. but if you work with this modality you're going to be able cool. to advance and then from there you know be able to like go deeper and there are always different ways to go deeper like it depends some people jump in right at the deep end of the pool and they're like okay let's go all the way like psychedelic therapy for example is something that I know um you have interviewed many people about and that's something that I would say is come up and coming and very valid to address people who especially with high levels of trauma and PTSD Yeah. And I love the care and respect of where people are at that I'm hearing from you because I'm very much a like, let's swan dive, like let's swan dive. And actually while I'm swan diving, put this, throw the scuba gear on me. And I want to go deep into the ocean as I possibly can. That sounds awesome. Not everyone is like that, not even freaking close. And so there has to be a very, um, respect because you push people further than they're ready to go and you can actually make it worse, you know? Yeah. So it's, I think it's good for us all to say like, what am I ready to take on and handle? And I'm going to start here. I'm going to stay here for a little mm-hmm. while and then, you yeah. know, work my way into it. And it's good for a lot of people. And I also love what you're saying about starting with your health, because for me, I've always called getting healthy, my uh, gateway drug, the personal awakening. I was not yes. expecting it, but as I got healthier in my mind and my body, I started questioning a lot of my belief systems. And I also saw that I was like, wait a minute, 
I was able to change my, my habits and, and the way I see life and, you know, what I perceive as normal enough that I get to live like this. Now I get to feel like this. I feel freaking amazing. I didn't even know human beings could feel like this. Mm -hmm. So that opened the door for me to be like, dude, what else is going on in my thinking patterns where I could be living in a completely different reality if I'm willing to take a look and repattern them. So I, I, I love that answer of like, start with health too, because it also provides this amazing uh, canvas, this amazing platform that's really healthy and, and fine tuned so that you can more easily process some of these deeper things. Cause you're not also dealing with extreme fatigue and, you know, mm-hmm. inflammation and brain, your brain fog and all of that. So right. that kind of transitions us into your course. I want to talk about for a second. So can you tell them a little bit about the, the program? Let's talk about your, your, your main course, um, mm-hmm. and also your book. So the healthy food, the healing foods method, sorry. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? So my course has been in existence for about six years now, and awesome. it has also transformed quite a bit. But basically, it started like, you know, like the name says, it's about healing foods. And for me, it's about healing in accordance with the natural processes of the body. Nice. And then it's also evolving into healing into the natural processes of the human being. Mm. at all energetic levels nice. so like we were saying we start with the body really but in reality we're dealing with all the different complex layers of the human being and so there is you know i like it it's kind of an umbrella solution because we address so many different really important aspects and because it's a program that's targeted mainly to women, of course, like the endocrine hormonal health aspect is very big, but it did start six years ago. The first version was like a metabolic um, reversal program. That's when nobody talked about keto and nobody knew what keto even was. And this is, was started as a ketogenic adaptation program to reverse metabolic damage. And nice. like reverse insulin resistance, right. diabetes. I was pre-diabetic. So when I wrote the program, I was like, I need something to reverse my own pre-diabetes. Mm-hmm. But that part was easy. You know, that part is done quite easily. I got to say, it's like the tip of the iceberg because then you get into hormones, you know, and even like diabetes or insulin resistance, they're tied to hormones. And then the, those right. hormones that are like insulin, for example, which is a very important hormone, connects to your cortisol, connects to your sex hormones as a woman, connects to your thyroid hormones. Everything is like woven together. So if you're like, let's say a client goes to an endocrinologist, a conventional endocrinologist, what do they do? They run labs. They look at one number of your thyroid and they give you medication. And that's the end of the story. They don't even look at your stress hormones. They don't even barely look at your female hormones because that's for another doctor. They have no idea what's going on. Your pancreas or your cortisol, that's for another doctor. You know, it's like- Yeah, and there's zero questions about your lifestyle or anything. (laughs) It's just a number. Zero. Oh no, the diet doesn't matter at all. (laughs) So it is like you're a chest of drawers, not a person. You know, it's like every piece of your health is a little drawer that is like compartmentalized. Right and separate it so this is like about a truly holistic view of the human being and it starts from the foundation of the physical health so it starts from like regulating blood sugar getting a diet that is custom tailored to the individual and their age and you know their sex and you know their hormonal status because we are all different so as you know being a keto expert yourself you know that women need to do keto in different ways as they age or right. you know as they train you do different if you're in right. menopause you do different and if you're in right. postmenopause you do different than perimenopause right so or have about, hormone issues you know a different purpose different versus like right. versus amenorrhea. like a super active athlete yeah <laughs> exactly right so this is what i really love about the evolution of the program is now i work one on one only and i don't do groups anymore First, because I burned out from doing groups and it was too many people for too long. 
mm-hmm. and they couldn't give people the attention that they right. really deserved. So yep. um, I changed like about two years ago into just mm-hmm. working on with clients one on one. Awesome. And really taking them to a deeper level of transformation. And um, so it, we address pretty much every facet of health in the program. Mm-hmm. And it's, I like it because the structure gives me the ability to not flop around or skip things or get random about right. things and just follow a program. Right. So it's yeah. pragmatic. And the client and, knows what to expect too, which is always nice to have that roadmap, you know, so they, they get the process and what they're doing. Yeah. Right. And, and real quickly, I just have to mention, um, that yes. you also, um, created the essential carnivore diet cookbook with Aaron Blevins, who was also yes. on the show. So if you guys heard the Aaron Blevins ep- okay. episode, this is the cookbook that they created together. And it's like, wowie, wowie. So I love that you're using keto for this purpose. I was like, well, aren't we just peas in a pod? <laughs> Cause that's no, how I totally. see keto. It's like, it's such a b- incredible, powerful tool for healing healing the body and optimizing the metabolism. Like, it's just like, Hey, we could like make this take a really long time or we can just get the job done, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love, I love your um, perspective on that. Um, And I love your perspective because you do keto for like as a healing diet, right? not keto forever. And I'm totally with you kind of with any diet, restrictive diet, even carnivore, you know, carnivore for me is not a forever diet necessarily, unless you really have to. You right. know, it can be just a healing diet. And like, this is my other book, by the way, where is it? that just got second edition. It came out with a new title. And for right. me, this is a healing diet. And this is the way that I do ketogenic because it's like, it's more than just like keto ratios. It's also healing foods. And here we're back to the healing foods. It's like, we can heal with foods, but we need to do it in the right way. And, and real and then, quick. Mm-hmm. Sorry to interrupt. If people That's are listening okay. on audio, it's keto cooking for healing and weight loss. Correct? Yeah. Is that the yeah. name of it? Okay. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's you know really about understanding how to eat, like create a foundation of a healthy diet that is non-denominational in a way. And yeah. what does that mean? <laughs> I love so, that. You know, people come in are like, oh. I'm going to do keto and carnivore. And then can I go back to eating donuts? I'm like, right. um, that, that is, is not healthy. That is <laughs> why know? I created my program and wrote this book. Right. That it right there. I, I, you know, everybody talks to me about keto because they have like identified me as the keto, the keto mm-hmm. trainer, you know? And I, like, I would hear this all the time. Like they're eating like chips and uh, drinking soda. And they're like, oh, I got to get back on keto. And I'm like, we have failed you. We have failed you. This is like, the all in or all out thinking there has been no lifestyle right. change. It was like an extreme, right. you know, challenge that you did and like, like, oh, it makes me so sad. But yeah, it's, I, I love what you're saying there. Cause it's when, when you look at it as a tool, like a step in your process, you know, not as this like thing you have to do forever, like that, that mentality completely removes logic. It removes intuition. It, it, it puts the power outside of you of like, even if I don't feel like this is right for me anymore, I have to do it. Cause this is good. And if I don't do it, I'm bad. And all of this crazy thinking it's like, no, 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 no. You hold the Radical. power. You hold the power. You're doing something proactive for yourself. That's cool. When that does not feel aligned anymore, or you're getting feedback from your body that it's not, you right. still hold the power. You make those changes, you know? So yeah, <laughs> I love and following your intuition as well. This is like yeah. another thing that my program is really designed to help Oof, you reconnect. Awesome. I'm like, reconnect your head with your body. Yeah, <laughs> you know? definitely. To listen to what's going on because we are so cut off. And, you know, because of all the toxicity and interference of, you know, the foods that are make you stupid, I'm sorry, but you say it about being able to be more awake and right. more um, interested in going deeper once you clean up your health, of course, because right. a lot of what we take in, it makes us numb, but at a brain level numb, you know? Right. So there is like a stupidification of the people and it's, kind of by design as well like you know stupid people they don't think for themselves they just buy whatever is put in front of them and you know and it's it like all up. none of us really want to admit that you know like but if you've lived an experience 
of being more tapped in and more aware as you've optimized your health. And then you ate a bunch of garbage and went back to old patterns and saw how you felt for a few days, you know, a day or two after that, it's like your, your desire to eat that way gets incredibly diminished. And it has nothing to do with like your body fat percentage or your aesthetics. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not feeling like that. Like, I mean, like, man, it's going to have to be real worth it. And I'm probably not even going to eat that much of it. Cause like, I don't want to go into that state. Cause you don't realize it's just, you don't realize you can feel better <clears throat> until you do. And then when that gets taken from you by some choice that you made, like drinking alcohol, every time I drink alcohol, I'm like, why did I do that? It's so rare, but I'll go to some, you know, social event or something. And I'm like, why would people want to do this? It just, I felt more stupid when I was intoxicated. And then afterwards I feel like crap and my workout sucks. And like, I'm not driven. I just, I can't, this is horrible, you know? So once you experience something different and you know, it can be better, the whole game gets a whole lot easier because you're making your decisions, not out of like, Oh, I'm not supposed to, that's bad. I can. And then the, the inner child rebel comes out. It's, it's more of this empowered adult energy of like, why would I want to do that? That's going to suck, you know? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk about your other, cause you, I mean, gosh, girl, I was looking through your website and I was like, dang, she's been busy. You have <laughs> produced some amazing things. So can we talk about just your other, your books and your products that you have <laughs> on your website? Yeah, I know. I had to do kind of a roundup of things recently because like I've been around for a long time in the digital space. Yeah. And sometimes I don't even realize all the stuff I put out there. So. It, it, let me let me just say, guys, it's the nourished caveman.com is the website. Yeah. And she has so many programs, meal plans, like great resources, interviews, um, information on keto, recipes. I mean, that's kind of your jam, right? Is the the recipes and the and food mm -hmm. and like, yeah, you've got quite the tool belt here, you know, the yeah. wisdom and knowledge behind what you're doing. And then the practical application of here's awesome things to eat that are going to make you feel really good. So. Thank you. And I think the latest evolution of everything I put it, I try to condense it all into one place so people can have a good overview. And uh, I created a page just called it's on the healingfoodsmethod.com website and yeah. it's the healingfoodsmethod.com slash services. Slash so, what? services services that okay yeah, awesome that we'll, we'll link that in the show notes for you guys too okay. on, on on youtube and on all the audio platforms so man yeah. vivica it's been so awesome to like be able to talk to you on this interview because i'm like when are we gonna meet i gotta see you at an event or something we're like soul sisters on the same freaking totally. mission totally. <laughs> and i, I love tell. you know honestly like just hearing you say like i actually pulled away from group stuff so i could help people more i'm like okay. I love you. <laughs> it just shows where your heart is and the dedication. Like you're truly after healing and helping not just, you know, bolstering up yourself and helping people at a shallow level. It's really freaking cool. And I really respect that. So thank you so, so much for coming on. Um, I guess in closing, if there's one thing that you would say, like that you want people to carry away in their hearts from this interview, what would that be? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but I have like these little heart things in me. I'm like, oh, I just want people to like, I just want to share this. Do you have anything like that? I think that in the end of the day, everything we do for ourselves, our, the, our goal should always be to become more loving and mm -hmm. more loving towards ourselves. And then yeah. so we can irradiate that love towards I others. Love that. I love that. And if that's Thanks. the only goal you can make, it's good enough. <laughs> uh, so wise. Yeah. Cause like when you, you know, um, sometimes I do like repatterning inner child type work, what, you know, I got a client and I'm like, there's no freaking way I'm putting you on a calorie cutting plan. Like that's been your whole life since you were like six years old. Like we're not, totally. we're not do it's doing the same thing. Um, and so we have to go through this phase of allowing the inner child to eat, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but that with a facet on that, I always say, yeah, but but not from that, that wounded child perspective from right. now, the loving adult perspective, right. That you didn't receive of like, you know, with my kids, I don't limit what they eat, but I'm like, let's eat your real food first. Cause your body needs nutrients. It's not that you can't have donuts and cake or whatever, but like your body needs some stuff to operate. So it's like, make sure we give that to our bodies. And so it's from that loving space instead of this restrictive, good, bad thinking, you know? So that is like such solid advice because everything like setting boundaries and relationships or going after your dreams to the things that you eat, to the way that you exercise or choose to take rest days. When you base that in self-love, 
the game gets right. so easy. Everything becomes so like alive and colorful and beautiful because it's all decisions based in love. And you're exactly right. Then you, that's all you want for other people too, because that's your, that's your mode of operation. That's your being is love. You, you operate in that frequency. And so then all of your interactions with others become more beautiful. So yeah, it's solid, solid advice. So thank you so much for that. And again, we guys will link everything, her websites, books, all of the products, courses that you guys could want from Vivica. And, um, man, thank you so much for coming on. It was really, thank really you so awesome. Thank so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you.